everyone. My name is Daniel Roddick, and I'd like to welcome you to our Monday episode of Founders Live. Every week, we uh, are interviewing some amazing founders from around the world, uh, hearing their stories, and hopefully helping answer some of your questions. So as, as we go along, please feel free to drop your questions into the comments, and we'll try to loop them into our conversation today. But I am super excited to have my friend Chris with us today. Chris, how are you? Hey, guys. How's it going? Very excited to be here. Thanks so much for joining us. And just before we went on, I realized it's been kind of two years since we uh, since we we last spoke. So I'm excited to get all the updates, and uh, I'm looking at your your new collections. I mean, this is not as new, but the high tops I always love. I saw you doing <laughs> boots now, so lots lots growing in the business. Indeed, lots has happened over the last two years. <laughs> uh, I love it. Well, I think there's so much to talk about the business, but what I found was most fun, and, and it sounds like in most interviews, people don't go this far back, so I'd like to, to be the lucky one to go this far back. And, um, you know, from, from last time we talked and when you read about your history, your life started in, in Germany, and, uh, and, you know, at least that's some part of the founding story of, of where the idea for Koyo came from. So I'd love to start there, just talking about, you know, what was it like growing up? You know, did you view yourself as as being an entrepreneur? Were there like entrepreneurial things you did, or was that something you discovered later in life? And so, um, yeah, where, where did you grow up in? If it was Germany or somewhere else, and and, and let's start from there. Yeah, absolutely. I was born and raised in Germany um, in a city called Dortmund. Um, mm -hmm. It's close to Düsseldorf and Frankfurt on the west side of Germany, and. Um, I had a yeah. I I would say I had a very good easy childhood, um, living more on the countryside of Germany than going to a public school in Germany. Growing up there, and my parents have always been big fans of the U.S. So every vacation they would do, they would bring me to the U.S. and planted a seat for sure um, that I wanted to come here later on. But it started really with me in high school doing a uh, exchange year abroad and then going again for college for a year abroad and then ultimately coming to the US for my MBA. And um, in terms of like entrepreneurial things, I don't think I ever wanted to be an entrepreneur. Like it wasn't like the number one thing on my agenda, but I, I guess I've always like enjoyed figuring things out and like making money on the side and just like <laughs> doing doing like fun things but originally i went to school for working in investment banking and that's mm -hmm. what i've done for the first two and a half years of my career um working at jp morgan in frankfurt and london and um while i learned a lot my life was not the best especially my social life so i decided <laughs> to make a change and come to the u.s Let's become a founder. That sounds like a good way to, to work less. <laughs> <laughs> Not really to work less, but at least you know what you're working at, what you're working for, where it's going towards. You know exactly, exactly, exactly. Well, um, you, know, you mentioned a you know when you're younger, you you kind of loved making you know, money on the side. Do you remember what was the first what was the first thing you did that you got paid paid for when you were a kid? So I've always had side jobs, like like from when I was 11 years old, I was always like working on the side. It really started super early on with handing out newspapers and tutoring people and younger people in my school. Um, but then I also started working for a company um, in my hometown that was a logistics company. And it started literally with me um, cleaning their backyard and then working <laughs> myself up to work in their office, fixing their printers and doing everything IT related. Um, so I always had like a few side projects um, during school. And I, I guess I always had the drive to like do more than just go to school and, yeah. and relax. How, how do you get a job cleaning up their backyard? That seems like a I wouldn't even have thought of that. Like, oh, someone will pay me to go do that. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like it's it's a more common thing in Germany, mm -hmm. um, probably where like people like hire you to do like all kinds of work, like and help them with little stuff uh, around the house. And and this is really like what started it. But then the the owner of the company had a question. He was like, "Can you help? Can you also help me install my TV and fix my printer?" And then I was doing that, and all of a sudden he saw how valuable I was to his office world. And then it be, really became an office job, and I would go like almost every day after school. <laughs> well, yeah. So when you're young, I guess you're the IT support. You're the computer whiz for. <laughs> oh yeah, just pretty much. Um, and so, so you went to school for, for, so I did a business undergrad as well, uh, around the same time as you. And, and funny enough, I had this 
before I knew what banking was, I never ended up doing banking, but that was in my head what I was wanting to do when I picked business school. That and I was like very terrible at chemistry, so I couldn't be an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but how did you decide on on business as the, the thing to pursue in, in undergrad? Um, so in Germany, it was common at the time um, to either do military service or community service after high school for, for guys. Um, and I did community service for a year. Uh, they've like changed the rules now, so you don't have to do it anymore. But I thought it was a very valuable year where you could really like hone in on what you wanted to do and take some extra time to, to figure out what you're most passionate about. And, um, yeah, looking at my dad, who's always worked in business and listening to some friends that were already pursuing that path, I decided to go down the business route and looked at a variety of schools before then ultimately joining a school in yeah, close to Frankfurt, um, where I started my bachelor's. Mm -hmm. And then was was banking the idea when you got into the school or what else did you taste and try or think? Oh, about? not at all. <laughs> not at all. I, I, I was never the kind of guy to, who really had like a career plan. I literally like, I didn't even know what investment banking was going, going, into, going into college, but then all of a sudden, um, yeah, we, we saw all these investment banks on campus. They were presenting to us. They had like invitations for a few students to come and join them on their spring week to really see what banking is all about. And I saw how competitive it was and how everybody wanted to go in it at the time. So I was like, I just got to try it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was it was exciting for, for a couple of years, um, but then quickly lost its appeal. Yeah. Yeah, well, I have a lot of friends who went through 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 banking, and it's certainly a, a grind, especially in those in those early years. But um, one other thing, and and we're, we're obviously going to jump around a little bit, but um, you so you you did a um, you mentioned you did a, um, a semester abroad in high school. You did it again in, in university. Do you you know are there any memorable um, kind of stories from either of those? You did it sounds like you did California for your undergrad in high school. Did you also were you in California or somewhere else? Uh, in high school, I was actually in Minnesota. Um, oh wow! In, uh, yeah, <laughs> like in, in a small town outside of Minneapolis called Chakopee. Um and I spent yeah like six months there. My dad has a cousin there, so I stayed with them. But it was yeah. really my first full U.S. experience, and I absolutely loved it. Out at the time, places. coming to the U of mm -hmm. all places, and I'm so grateful that I saw this side of the US before going to New York or California, because I feel like it's, yeah, it's the more, yeah, like the bigger area of the US is like this. It's like more traditional. It's not just like the coastal cities. And I really enjoyed it and growing up there and spending a year in school, I came there barely speaking English. Um, then all of a sudden they throw you into the school where you don't know anyone. And, yeah. um, yeah, you need to learn. You really need to learn on the fly. And funny enough, I also had a side job there. Actually, I was oh. working at a, I was working at a Renaissance festival in 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 Minneapolis, um, to wow. to make to make some extra money on the side. Um, but it was it was a cool experience. And then obviously, um, I did a semester um, at USC during college, mm -hmm. which was super fun and like yeah enjoying college life in the us for the for the first time and seeing how different it is to the us and typically yeah experiencing what you would just otherwise see in movies yeah well especially i, I remember i used to spend some time i lived about a year and a half i was traveling a bunch but i was in cincinnati for, for about 2014 to 2015 and i found that to be just a, such a different pace to everywhere else, um, but seeing, I, I went to Canadian college, but even just being around US colleges, it's so different than, you know, when I've, I love visiting universities wherever I go, just to like walk around the campus and. Um, so nice, yeah. Yeah, but they're so, they're so great, especially at Marshall, it, like I'm pretty sure it's a big football football school if I remember. And so Absolutely, seeing yeah. like at a, I don't know if that's like with, with other sports in Europe, but like at a, a college football stadium is like the size of an NFL stadium at serious schools. <laughs> It's crazy. It's crazy. And that was like such a big difference. Like sports in college in Germany are not a thing at all. Like you have uh, sports teams in, in your towns and this is where you would play if you decide to play. But like there is no competitive or even uncompetitive sports in, in college. 
yeah, it's just a it's a hobby or way of life versus a you know your ticket to school. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, mean, I, I want to touch on this though for this in Minneapolis. I spent a bit of time there too. Was that sound like we were there in the summer or the winter? Uh, both. We oh, had so okay. many snow days. I, I I think I started in September and I left uh, in February. Um, oh, it was quite the, it. yeah. It was quite the experience. Um, the, the weather was was really like really really bad in <laughs> in winter. Um, I guess the good things were that you had snow days day after day. Um, you could go ice fishing and all these kinds of things, um, or drive around in a snowmobile. It was it was a very new world and very fun to see at the time. Yeah, Minneapolis is one of the few places in the U.S. Uh, other than obviously Alaska, but the, that is colder than most places, like the, ma the major <laughs> cities in Canada, right? Um, and, wow. uh, I'm sure if you if you had a chance to go through um, the the big city like Minneapolis, um, they have the skyways, which are like how you get around mm -hmm. there. And I met some people when I was doing some work there uh, with clients there, and they were like, "Yes, you know, if you really really wanted to, I'd never see the outdoors." They get in their car, they drive to work, they get into a parking lot, they go up to their office, come down, wow. drive home. So you can, it's like mole people. They don't have to be outside at all, huh? <laughs> they designed it well to avoid the cold. Um, but uh, anyway, so so you you finish you know, finish college, you get into the competitive world of of investment banking, uh, but then you eventually decide to do to do an MBA, and that's kind of where where everything started with with Coyo. So what well when you decided to do an MBA, did you have a vision of what you wanted to do out of that? Because a lot of people I know who do an MBA do it because I'd like to switch careers, I would like to get a promotion, I would, you know, so on and so forth. What was your view of why you were doing the MBA? Yeah, honestly, it was pretty similar to um, when I started college. I had no idea at first of what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to switch careers. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, even though a lot of people from my college went went on to Ber to live in Berlin and start companies there, also very big companies. Um, so I had a lot of friends in the in the venture entrepreneurship world, and I was very inspired by what they were doing. And I could see that this would be a more fulfilling path for me down the line as well. Um, and then, yeah, I started to go to business school at Penn. And um, pretty quickly on, met my co-founder, Johannes, who was the only other German in my year, and the <laughs> only other tall person, really. <laughs> um, easy to spot. Easy to spot. We connected quickly. And um, yeah, started talking and realized that we both had a passion for like, Italian craftsmanship and sneakers. Um, both of us grew up in Germany, kind of like sneakerheads, like always trying to get the latest drops and like really following this world. Um, but at the same time, also having like, um, yeah, a affection for traditional luxury brands. Um, the only issue was that these shoes were horrendously priced and mm -hmm. impossible, impossible to purchase if you wouldn't like get them in, on sale. So we, we got together, we talked about it and we were like, well, there must be a way to build a modern version of the luxury brand that is more targeted towards millennials and while you're not compromising quality and craftsmanship you build something that resonates more with the millennial generation and at the same time um yeah is a lot more affordable mm -hmm. and before we get into that story i'm because I I've lived through this too. There's always a bunch of other ideas that you said no to for anyone who's tried to start a company. I'm curious if you didn't do Koyo with with Johannes, was there a number two or number three idea that you you looked at, or was it out of the gate? Hey, this is where you kind of picked the idea and then ended up being the right one. Um, not really, actually. Um, at that time, we weren't actively thinking about another idea. It really came up as like, hey, let's look into this while we're at school. We, we Nobody um, of us thought that we were actually going to be working on this. Um, we just like started researching a little bit on the site after after classes, getting together, and all of a sudden, like we had an entrepreneurship class where we needed to work on a project, and we got some friends on board to keep thinking about this. And then it was summer and everybody was going on to their internships. And we were like, hmm, I guess we, we just started working on this. So we didn't really look into internships. Um, <laughs> so why don't we continue this? We moved to New York 
and for the summer and uh, got an intern and had all these crazy ideas and plans of where we wanted to be at the end of the summer like we were <laughs> like we're gonna have our first pair of shoes we're gonna have a whole collection designed we're gonna have a manufacturer set up and then end of summer came and we were literally nowhere um, <laughs> literally nowhere we at the time we're working we also had no idea about footwear right other than being fans uh footwear mm -hmm. fans we we didn't know how to construct a shoe or what it takes to build a shoe so we initially connected with professors at parsons and fit okay. and um they were explaining shoe construction to us and they were walking with us through the city telling us about the different cuts and models and constructions and one of these guys worked for us and helped us develop um prototypes early on very cool and what was your initial pitch to them because it you know it sounds natural to you or to me to be like hey like i'm just gonna email a bunch of professors to go tour me around the city but you know what, what was your pitch to them for them to spend time with you to, to even do that yeah, it wasn't easy. I feel like more and more so people are reaching out and being like, I have a great idea. Do you want to work with us? Um, we were really telling them that we are passionate about this project, that we want to find a way to like open up the high-end sneaker market to a bigger number of people. And I think that resonated with them. That was also what ultimately resonated with our manufacturer in Italy to, mm -hmm. to work with us. Um, and yeah, I mean, like we were trying to not use a bunch of their time listening to their classes and like just mm -hmm. learn a little bit as we were going. We also had this crazy idea of involving their classroom in our first ever design um, where we asked them, hey, maybe we do a design competition. Uh, you can use it as part, as part of your class and whoever wins creates our first sneaker. That idea <laughs> didn't go down well either. <laughs> um, it was also big learning. We had all these students that had never created a shoe in their real life coming up with these crazy ideas and then just like us had no idea how to translate it into a real into a real shoe. Um, well, you get just got to multiply your craziness. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. oh, yeah, it's not just us. No one else knows <laughs> either. Pretty much. <laughs> um, so was the um, the 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 initial design you went with to manufacture it, was that from the professor that helped you or did you end up doing more iterations before you actually you know had the first you made so in terms of design we actually had a pretty clear idea of what we wanted we launched with our primo high tops first and mm -hmm. um we kind of had this image in our mind so but both of us can't draw i guess i can't draw a shoe like my friends <laughs> still make fun of me about that <laughs> like <laughs> calling yourself a shoe designer then you can't even draw a, a shoe on a piece of paper but um I had a, like a pretty good idea of what I liked and what I didn't like, and so did he. And we and had a joint vision, so we created that in New York. The prototypes were all horrendous, um, mm -hmm. and the and trying to find a manufacturer from the U.S. was also impossible because mm -hmm. either they didn't even have a website or uh, it was all in Italian. <laughs> um, we figured like at some You're point from the wrong like, country if only you were two italians it would have been a bit easier exactly. <laughs> exactly. and at some point we were like we gotta go there um otherwise we won't we will never figure this out so we decided to come back to school a few weeks later and uh, push in a one-way trip to italy first and we did that taking along with us a friend who spoke italian and really like touring factory after factory down there um, and breaking into this secretive society um, because yeah. it was very secretive. People wouldn't give out names. Um, so yeah, we were li literally hustling and trying to find our way into into one of these manufacturers. And well, the sorry to interrupt, but what did you learn? Of what was the nature of the secrecy? Because I would think you know, on one hand, they should be proud of their their work, but I can see on the other hand, they don't want necessarily outsiders coming into their community, right? Well, I think it's uh, it's actually a little different. The manufacturers themselves, they're super proud and they want their names out in the world. But <laughs> brands working with these manufacturers, uh, they want to keep it a secret. And oh, it's, so to even know that, it's, it's hard. Like, yes, <laughs> and even to this date, like when we're working with our manufacturers and like um, when they're sending, we have some wholesale partners and brand partners, some of them were shipping shoes directly from Italy and they always love to tape their boxes with their names back and forth and address and i'm like no 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 no, guys <laughs> um <laughs> you can't do this but it's crazy obviously if you've like found a really good manufacturer you want to like keep it 
to to yourself and not want everyone to produce there because it is in a way a competitive advantage but the manufacturers themselves they want their name out there they are the proudest people you can imagine yeah for all you know maybe there's some secret code underneath the soul that they're stitching <laughs> oh like sometimes they put it in the soul sometimes they put their names in the soul it's crazy <laughs> there's a there's a building in toronto um it's one of our old courthouses and there was i, I can't remember the full story but the short version of the story is that they, they built the whole building, but the architect couldn't put their name on it. And so there's all these keystones around the building that essentially spell their initials or their name as their way to be like, yeah, I built this, even <laughs> though I can't tell you. <laughs> That's clever. That's clever. So, um, but so, so you, you, so obviously the manufacturers are proud, um, so, you know, obviously they want more clients and things like that. So how, how did you, because you have many things working against you, right? It's hard to find the manufacturers. You don't speak the language and then you have to sell not only the introduction to get to them, but also sell the manufacturer to be like, yeah, you can trust me. We are two Germans living in America and we're going to build this amazing shoe company. <laughs> um, walk me through that, you know, make, let's break it down. So when you book that trip to Italy, how do you, do you have your 34 factories on a list or what did not you- Not at all. Yeah. We had maybe two factories on the list, um, <laughs> but we knew the area of where they were producing or like a few of the areas. Um, but that was the whole part. Like we, we couldn't find out their names and we were watching manufacturing videos of other brands that we admired at the time and were looking for clues. It was real detective work, but like you, you couldn't find out much. <laughs> so we flew to Italy um, and we went to one of the leather fairs, um, Mikan, where the, yeah, every year they would present you like the newest materials. And we were asking everyone there. We were like, hey, who, do you know who works with X or Y? Do you know where we can find a great shoe manufacturer? And like, eventually we started gaining some traction and people were giving us some names and mm -hmm. we would drive there um with a piece of paper in our hand of like hey this is the shoe that we want to create and hey this is the bigger vision we really want to create this modern version of a luxury brand for our generation and um make um yeah make high-end shoes more affordable and more accessible to a wider part of the generation and that's what really clicked with the owners of the factories and where they were like okay we'll give you a try even though you don't know anything about footwear <laughs> and all you have is like a, um, a drawing that doesn't help us much yeah we'll, um we'll figure yeah it out. but but pretty much we asked from one place to the other. We asked everyone uh, to connect us with new factories. And then you were quickly like going from one factory to the next mm -hmm. um, and learning and learning more about them. And and so the one that you ended up working with was like, you don't obviously it's very secretive. So I'm not going to ask you to reveal your secret. But <laughs> how did you end up meeting the the factory you ended up going with? What was the story of how you connected with them? Um, so we, in one of these videos that we were watching, we saw that, um, there were like leather cutting machines and we saw the names of the leather cutting machines. So we went to the factory for the leather, leather cutting machines and asked them, Hey, do you know where factory, uh, X is or where brand X is producing? And they're like, actually they haven't paid us for our last leather cutting machine. I'm going there tomorrow. Do you want to come? <laughs> and then we went along. That's amazing. And this Coming is how in. we broke in. Yeah. And That's at the great. time, it was a family owned business that is now, um, that was now largely acquired by Chanel. And it was, they were producing for literally only like the most high end brands, including Chanel, MS, right. uh, Balenciaga, and like didn't have any smaller brands working with them. And they are also very proud that they have been like our key factory from the get go. Mm -hmm. and have remained this relationship and and so so obviously they b believe in the vision and you and you get them excited but you know it also comes down to like to money so how, how do you pay for what's the like the deal being like trust me produce you know x number of shoes and like i'm good for it how did that you know the 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 dollars and cents end up playing out for your first shipment so the good thing about italy is that you can ask for smaller batches because mm -hmm. they're yeah handmade higher priced it's not like china where you have to order like i don't know 
minimums of like five, ten thousand. Mm. So we could literally ask for a couple hundred to start with, mm. which was nice. And mm. before we got to the couple hundred, we were doing so many prototypes, making sure the shoe was literally perfect. Mm. Um, and all this development costs, they barely, they barely build us for. Um, they're always hoping to recoup it through larger orders, but these mm. larger orders initially wouldn't come from us because <laughs> we were still trying to figure things out. Um, but yeah, we were like, for our launch, we want to get like 500 pairs and um, ordered them across like three or four different colorways. And that was no problem. And at the time we raised like a very small friends and family round at Wharton with our friends who gave us some money to pay for the first production run. Because we, um, yeah, we had to pay for our business school and like didn't have any additional money that we could put ourselves into the business. Okay. So for us, it was always like we needed to be financed somehow. Um, and we ordered these 500 pairs and then we launched at the very end of our second year in Wharton where we rented a pop-up store you know, on Bowery and Bleecker in New York. Wow. Um, it was, I think it was in March and drove there in a u-haul from philly with 500 <laughs> shoes in the back rented a small airbnb um and wanted to make this like this big massive sales day and we all had crazy illusions of how it's how it was gonna go down like wow we're gonna be sold out in in a few hours it's gonna be crazy there's gonna be a line around the block you have all these crazy ideas um which are which are kind of fun and nice, right? That's what kind of keeps you going. But then you can land very hard when it doesn't come across like that. So we were very unlucky because the day when we the day when we decided to launch, it was like part of one of the coldest three consecutive days in New York. It was oh snowing um, and it was freezing. So. <laughs> like and we were like trying to set up the store and we opened up and there was literally not a person on the street um some of our <laughs> friends were trickling in we had a dj there that was playing music we had other friends to help us and we were like guys let's go on the streets and hand out flyers and get people in here um <laughs> it, it was of yeah it was it was wild and very different compared to how we expected it originally so leading up to that, a few, few different questions from um, from the collection that you can see on the site right now. What were the can can you still buy that first version, like the colors that are available? Which uh, which ones did you launch with? So if you go to our website, it's the Primo. Mm -hmm. That's the high top model that we launched with, um, and the Primo Nero, the all black version, the Primo Triple White, and the other the other colorway is currently. Um, removed and sold out, mm. but it was a burgundy version of it. And so, how do you decide? Because you have to you pick three colors, but then you also um, you have to also pick like sizes, right? And ideally, you know, when the brand is in full flight, you have SKUs and enough sizes for everyone. How did you pick? How did you make a decision on like how many size elevens or forty twos or thirty fives? <laughs> Um, so initially we just ordered it for men and we looked up online size breakdowns and like some curves. So you would typically go with a lot of size nines and size tens, mm -hmm. a few, a few size 12 and 13s. Um, and we got them into the store, but then the first shoes that were sold out were all the lower sizes because women started buying our lower sizes. Very cool. And they were like, oh, these shoes are really cool. Why don't I wear them as well? And then we didn't have any more smaller sizes. And But that was literally the tipping point for us where we decided, hey, let's build a unisex brand. Why, do we, why would we only do men's? We're doing the same shoe and we're doing it unisex for, for guys and girls alike. So yeah, that's what I was, I was going to ask was, how did you make the decision then to eventually launch a, a women's dedicated collection? When, when, did, like, when did that happen in the business? For the first couple of years, it was really like all unisex. Mm -hmm. um, and at some point we decided like, hey, maybe we're going to go for a few more silhouettes that our women customers have asked us to go into. Like we were getting requests and we were seeing them through interactions in the store, getting customer feedback that they wanted yeah, specific colorways and the specific line. And then um yeah started coming out with women specific shoes or shoes that are more heavily um female than, than male probably like two and a half years ago 
Yeah. You know what? I, I'm pretty sure you mentioned that in the works when we last met, met up for coffee, that it was like on the horizon at some point. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. And now, now we don't do unisex shoes anymore because the men's and the women's foot are built pretty differently. We're now like all the shoes that you see on our website are either dedicated women's or dedicated men's shoes. And we're coming out with more and more unique designs and styles, especially this year for, for both. Very cool. Well, see, so, yeah, so, so jumping back to, to the start of the business. So, you know, the first few days are a quite unfortunate timing, um, but how do you end up selling through that first, that first order? What, you know, was it mainly online? Was it just through pushing the store? Hustling. It was really hustling. <laughs> we did like, we tried everything we could. Um, a lot was obviously through friends and they all loved our shoes. They like, it was the thing that we learned was like putting our shoes online at like Facebook or one of these, um, online um online market using online marketing to promote our brands mm -hmm. when your brand is unknown the price point is 250 to 300 dollars it is pretty tricky but we realized that um when people saw our shoes and put them on they were blown away by the quality by the craftsmanship by the smell of the leather and by how it felt on their foot and they were like very easily convinced to put down $300. So we did a bunch of pop-ups early on um, mm. where we would go and partner with other stores, but we would go to an Equinox on a Saturday and put up, set up shop and sell shoes. That's and so cool. it really worked. It, it really worked well. Um, and we quickly learned like, hey, for us, we to make online marketing work, we definitely need to better convey the product attributes mm -hmm. um, and build some credibility, which we eventually did through some good press features. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, for us, I think it was vital to have pop-up stores or, or a store where, mm -hmm. where people can see the shoes in, in person. Yes, yeah, so, so this is kind of tying into the the question we we, we briefly touched on, on on opening stores as to why it was important. But before we jump there, how, how, like with Equinox example, how do you convince them to let you set up shop in their in their lobby because they have their own stuff to sell, right? <laughs> so what, yeah, do you remember which uh, Equinox location you did and and who you pitched and what we did a them? few of them actually. Um, it started in Soho. And I think at the time we were both members, my co-founder and I at, at Soho, and we saw one of the, the trainers or one of the people working there wearing our shoes and they loved us and they asked us to come in. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, pretty and um, then we did it in West Village and then we did a big, bigger program with them, like across like four or five of their locations, even in LA as part of their store. But wow. It loses so much appeal whether you put it just in the store or you have like an extra small booth and the founders are there and telling the brand story and you're connecting one to one with potential customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but it was great. I think there's a big overlap between the Equinox customer and the Koyo customer. I just think in general, um, yeah, when they go to the gym, they're not necessarily going to shop, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless you create an event for it, which would make sense. Correct. Like, this is a fun, you know, an Equinox member started this business. Come take a look at this collection, and there's like a reason to to go engage. Versus exactly. Uh, yeah, ninety percent of the time when I would walk through the gym in the merch section, it's like I just want my smoothie. That's just probably the merch <laughs> I'm gonna buy. <laughs> yeah, you're more annoyed by it than anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so eventually, so you you do end up actually starting a permanent store. Right, what, right yeah. um, and and how that all came together. I, I really love that story. So maybe you can tell that again. Of you know, how did you? What made you decide? Okay, no more pop ups. We're opening up a store, and then you know, how did you negotiate it? Open it up. What was that whole story like? So it was actually another pop up um, that <laughs> transformed into a permanent store. Um, but our first real store opened in December 2016 on Broom and Lafayette in Soho, New York. And our office was right next door. Like mm -hmm. 2016 was really the first real year for us. We just raised our first round of um, venture capital funding, and our seed round really that that got us off the off the ground. We opened an office. We hired one additional person, and we were starting to work like a real company. Um, <laughs> and we saw that there was a space on Room in Lafayette next to our office that was the old an old outdoor voices space that they moved out of to move around the corner and there was a big space. Very so cool. we were like, 
wow, this is like a really, really cool space, corner space, um, but at the same time, it's it's way too big. And one of our advisors was like, why don't you ask the landlord and see if you can rent it out for a couple months over Christmas? It's empty right now. So they it could be a win-win. They get some money. You guys can get to try this. And he agreed to it. So what we did is we split the store in half. We mm. brought in another brand, the brand that we're uh, friendly with. And um, for the top half, and we took the, the lower half. We built it out like ourselves very cheaply for for like a week and put like some temporary structures in there. And given that we were only three or four people, including us two founders, we were sitting in the store and selling the shoes. Um, during the day, we would take turns. On Monday, Johannes would go in. On Tuesday, I would go in. And on Wednesday, our customer service um, associate would go in and sell the shoes and we would just take turns but we saw that it worked so well like this area was like flooded with foot traffic at the time mm -hmm. and the right kind of foot traffic and people loved engaging with us loved trying on the shoes and it was a relatively easy sell mm -hmm. so after three months we decided hey um let's um let's ask and see if we can make this permanent and then we signed a 10-year lease uh down there and built the store out more professionally hired a store team mm -hmm. and have been using this as our hub and typically are also hosting events there pre-covid like on a monthly basis where we would bring in collaborators and like do fun activations and was it the same footprint you signed up for or did you took the whole space because i remember no it's the same footprint so yeah that's, and so, so uh, between the three of you, who sold the most shoes for that three months? Who's the best <laughs> person on the floor? <laughs> uh, I, I really don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> we didn't keep track of it that way. Do you? But you know, interacting with customers. I mean, I guess you did it through through all the pop ups and stuff. Do you? Do you remember your approach when someone would walk into the store? What uh, what, what did you find was the best way to engage with someone? Because uh, you know, not everyone who sells a you know people would view you as a D 2 C brand. But you actually had a lot of experience building this out in traditional retail, which I think most most founders have not experienced. Um, and so, for you, when someone walks through the store, what did you find was the best way to to understand it to the right customer and ultimately like have them walk out with a pair of shoes? I think um, it really depends on the person that walks in. You kind of got to learn to read that person a little bit. Some mm -hmm. people that walk in don't want to be talked to that much. And other people that walk in love to be entertained and like to 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 hear about it. Um, but we obviously fine tuned our approach a little bit during those three months. Um, and it also really helped us work with our store teams now and like advise mm -hmm. them on what has worked, what doesn't work. And and see where they where we can improve, mm -hmm. but I think ultimately it comes down to being very genuine and authentic, really like trying to understand what they came in for, and then giving them, yeah, the quick the quick brand story that the shoes were made in Italy, that um, yeah, now we're using very sustainable materials, and uh, the shoes are very comfortable. They should try it out, and as soon as they tried it out, that was typically the flipping the flipping point. Got it. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a sign. It's a good, a good product. I just did a, an interview with um, on Friday with the the CEO of Barry's Barry's Bootcamp, mm -hmm. and it's a similar. Like, so they've actually grown their whole business without like really any paid social or any like any market. It's all, it's, I guess, in a different way. It's their own brick and mortar experience up until mm -hmm. up until COVID, and and it's the same thing. Once you walk in the room, that's what you know converts What's someone. It, yeah, right. And that so makes sense. It's it's just a sign. It's a it's a good product. Um, so, 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 and just for everyone to know now, how many, where did you end up taking the store count to before COVID? What's, what was the store reach? Uh, we had four right before COVID and we kept most of them open. So currently we have three. Um, one was mm -hmm. a pop-up that we shut down in Miami um, mm -hmm. earlier this year, but we have still have three locations, one in Venice Beach, California, one in on Fillmore Street in San Francisco and our um flagship store in new york on room and lafayette same spot <laughs> same spot and we've been open uh, the stores have been open since september last year and That's we are cool. really seeing like obviously last year was very challenging um with the, the pandemic but we're now seeing like a return to people coming back to the store and generally like also shopping for shoes yeah yeah, yeah. Well, I can even feel it myself. Just like the the pleasure of just walking through a store is is so nice <laughs> to try something on and and 
yeah, just experience it before you actually buy something. Absolutely, absolutely. It was really missing last year. <laughs> so, I mean, as we're as we're coming up on time, the, the the last piece I wanted to touch on, we we you know I was talking the importance of of stores, but for the online component of the business, what were some of your learnings there, and you know how what worked back then to convert online sales, and and how has that changed today in terms of channels or messaging? You know, what have you what have you learned over the past whatever six years it's been? Um, I think the key thing is brand comes first. Um, and that has always been like our credo, um, mm -hmm. going into, going into the day, we really wanted to build a brand that stands for something and that is, uh, differentiated and where we give customers a, a super quality product. Mm -hmm. We've never been in engaging in discount strategies that much, um, in order to protect our brand equity, because we feel like discounts may work in the short term and they give you great results if you slap like a 50 percent off on it but ultimately it is really damaging your brand and it's hard to find customers that pay full price if you're constantly on discount mm -hmm. so that's one thing that we stayed away from and in terms of building a brand and differentiating our brand there's like yeah, we constantly work on reiterating our concept and what we stand for and how we can get this message across more precisely. Mm -hmm. And we've really used the pandemic to shift our approach a little bit and add another brand pillar in. Mm -hmm. Before the pandemic, we were really resting on Italian craftsmanship, high-end materials, um, the versatility of our shoes and the comfort of our shoes. But since the pandemic hit, we've um, made such a big shift internally in, to include sustainability. And that will be a big, big shift for us going mm -hmm. forward and probably the key focus area going forward. And we're, now, mm -hmm. uh, we're now trying not to be just like a more affordable, more digital modern version of a luxury brand we're now trying to be the first regenerative luxury footwear brand where all the material that we're using have a sustainability story components to them and um, are creating actually shoes that are not harming the environment and that last for a very long time that's amazing and, and so with the story like is that that kind of brand pillar can you know then create a whole kind of go to market plan behind it. How does that translate in terms of in terms of like the ads you're running? Like is it long form video that you're putting on Facebook or tacti tactically when you take that pillar, what does that look like in terms of execution of how you tell the story? Um, it becomes a bigger focus point obviously for storytelling as well. Um, yeah, I mean, like video has always worked well and works well, like traditionally our brand video cut up in smaller pieces into like 10 second, 15 second or 30 second pieces has worked really well on, on online marketing. And now we're trying to recreate this, uh, with the sustainability story in mind as well. If you're, we're having actually a big, yeah, a big, um, storytelling week during earth week that's coming up where we're like, um, highlighting more and more to our customers what, where the journey is going to go. We have the first products out that are made of recycled materials and are using wow. LWG gold certified leathers where there's less, uh, toxins used in like tanning the leather and stuff like that. So we're, we're making our first steps already. And um, we are now really presenting our roadmap in the next few in the next few weeks and want to do this in a very transparent way, taking accountability and being authentic and not over promising, but really only promising what we're doing, because I think that's that's really what's what's important. Like not just not saying, hey, the shoe that you're buying is 100 percent recycled recycled when mm -hmm. it's not yeah. um like other brands do but really like giving them a story sure. to to believe in here's our roadmap and right now we're here but in the long run we're aiming to be there that's great that's really great well i mean it's you kind of already answered my part i would love to close off on is what are you excited about for the future of Co koyo so this is obviously a big part of it so maybe i'll ask it a bit differently for you personally what is um let's assume the world returns back to normal you can travel to all the places you want to go to and all that you know, outside of uh, everyone's travel aspirations, what what is uh, maybe not what's left, but what are what comes to mind when I say what's next on your bucket list personally of something you'd like to do, something you'd like to learn, 
Uh, what's next that excites you, Chris? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, obviously, the pandemic has like had a toll on us um, very much. So for me, like having spent so much time in the US now, I'm really looking forward actually to going uh, back to seeing my family in Germany. Um, my sister is expecting, so I'm really excited to see my my new niece um, and like spending time spending time with family that has come very short in in recent in recent weeks yeah, and months. Least- are they all still in Dortmund or are they? Yeah, they are. They are all like in the Dusseldorf Dortmund area. Um, and obviously excited to see some friends in Germany as well. But like, that's, that's a big thing. It's not really a bucket list thing, but it's like a very it's important personal, personal thing for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm personally now working at exploring Germany as a, as a potential place we may expand to here at at Clearbank sometime oh, nice. in the future. So if it all comes to plan, maybe uh, when you get to visit Germany, I'll also get a visit too. <laughs> and Perfect. We'll have, yeah, let um, me if know. not copy in New York, we'll have, uh, you know, copy <laughs> in Germany. <laughs> Amazing. I'm super down for that. Awesome, Chris. Well, thank you again for taking the time. I really, uh, really enjoyed uh, catching up with you in front of uh, everyone here. And uh, for everyone watching, we have a conversation tomorrow with Jennifer Yen, who is the founder and CEO of Pure Lease. If you ever watch Power Rangers, Chris, she used to be a villain on the Power Rangers. So oh, really? <laughs> turn villain where she puts all this makeup on her on her face to, to now starting a couple of beauty brands. So it's a, a fun story. That's exciting. Yeah, but uh, great. Chris, thank you so much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your morning. And I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Thank you so much, Daniel. Awesome. Thanks so much Good for day. taking the time. See you. Bye.